Good evening, everybody. My name is Kara Manovich. I'm part of the Dunlap Institute here at the University of Toronto. So happy that you could join us for another edition of Cosmos from Your Couch. Um, tonight's talk is titled Wonder and Awe in Astronomy, and it's uh, presented by grad student Dylan Zhao, who he's a uh, part of the Department of Physics, um, and he specializes in cosmology and in, in uh, more particular terms, gravitational lenses of FRBs, um, which is also known as a fast radio burst. So we're going to uh, turn over the screen to uh, Dylan and enjoy. Feel free to pop a question in the chat if you'd like to ask him anything and uh, we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, and here's Dylan. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about might be a little bit different from some of the other talks that have come before in this series. Uh, I wanted to take a step back a little bit. So whereas the other talks may have been focusing on some specific aspect of astronomy and then the science involved in that, I wanted to take a step back and ask questions like, why do we do astronomy in the first place? Uh, there you go. Um, so I want to ask questions like, what drives our search for astronomical knowledge? And in particular, I want to figure out what, what cultural significance astronomy has held, either historically and, of course, today. And to answer that question, I'm going to draw connections between the concept of awe. Um, and to give the game away a little bit, I'm going to uh, suggest that the experience of awe connects astronomy to a deeper human drive for reconciliation with the natural world. And so what I mean by that will become clear but this is just an outline to sort of orient you before I start talking about things specifically. So as a graduate student, I study astrophysics. And that basically means when somebody asks me a question, uh, or when they ask me what I study, uh, I can give one of one of two answers. I can either say I study physics, or I can say, say I study astronomy. Um, and if I say I study physics, well, then the, the response is almost uniform. Uh, no matter who I talk to. And it's usually something along the lines of, that's nice, I hated, in physics. I hated physics in high school, you must be so smart or something like that. Um, so they'll sort of express some vague admiration for the fact that I do physics, but they kind of want to shut down the conversation very quickly because they don't want me to talk about math. That's the last thing they want me to start talking about. Um, and so they, they try to quickly shift the focus onto something else. Uh, but if I say I study astronomy, you get a completely different response. Uh, they'll say things like, wow, did you hear about that asteroid that came from outside of the solar system? Or they'll say something like, do you know about fast radio bursts? Um, occasionally, some people will ask me what my star sign is, which is less than ideal, because that's not what I do. Um, but the point is that when I say I study astronomy, people are interested. They start asking more questions. They want to know more about what I do. They keep the conversation open. And this is definitely not the case when I say I study physics. So at least anecdotally, it seems to me that people have maybe a more intrinsic interest in space than they do with maybe other sciences. And a more maybe insidious piece of evidence for this is you can look at conspiracy theories. Um, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories uh, surrounding astronomical phenomena. These are memes uh, uh, from that are related to these conspiracy, conspiracy theories. For example, uh, this one is a flat earther meme that you know it says that if the earth were really round, the plane would have to dip its nose as it flew or else, you know, it, or else it would fly off into space. Uh, and then this one of course is about how we obviously faked the moon landings, those, those weren't real. Um, and I, I don't know if there are uh, conspiracy theories to this level in other sciences. For, uh, another example is uh, my colleagues and I always get emails like this one. Uh, people who believe that they've uh, uncovered some hidden mistake in astronomy. This one is about eclipses. This guy is saying, oh, well, eclipses, uh, the, the current model of the solar system can't possibly explain eclipses because, well, the moon maybe goes in front of the sun and blocks out the sun. But what about Venus? Venus also does that and it doesn't block out the sun. Therefore, eclipses can't be explained by our current model. Of course, the answer is that Venus is very small on the sky, so it wouldn't block out the sun. Um, but, you know, some people get it into their heads that these can't possibly explain these things. And then they, they feel entitled to email people uh, uh, their, their pet theories. 
Uh, and I kind of have to wonder if people in the chemistry department are getting these these same emails because are people like really incensed by a chemist's work on fluorine? It, it seems like the sort of thing that people don't really care about. But for some reason, if you tell a person the earth is, is round, they, they take this as a personal offense, or at least some people. Um, uh, so at least to me, there seems to be a disproportionate interest in astronomy that there isn't uh, in other sciences. Um, and of course, you know, what I've said isn't entirely true. There's, there's lots of conspiracy theoretic fervor for medical sciences, for example, you know, with the anti-vax movement and whatever. Um, but that kind of makes sense to me because uh, medicine is a thing that affects our lives. We all have to get our vaccines. So it makes sense to me that everyone would have an opinion as to whether or not we should be getting our vaccines. But when it comes to astronomy, I, it's really hard to see how things affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Like even the fact that the earth is round, that might explain why time zones are the way they are. But you know, in my day-to-day -day, uh, life, I don't have to worry about the fact that the earth has curvature to it. It just seems flat to me. So it's not clear why, you know, or with eclipses, who cares how eclipses work? It's not, it's not clear why people uh, focus so strongly on these things uh, and, and feel like there's some that grand conspiracy uh, uh, surrounding astronomical research. Um, but maybe from a more practical perspective, you know, ignoring the people that are, are a little bit, that maybe take things a little bit too far in that direction, um, we, we can ask questions like, why do we fund astronomical research in the first place? If what I'm saying is true, that there's no real practical benefit, is it worth the tax dollars? Um, from a more personal perspective, uh, as a graduate student, I have to ask myself whether or not astronomy is worth devoting a career to, because, you know, as a graduate student, I will be spending a, a few years of my life uh, studying this, and maybe I will spend my entire life studying it, and I have to wonder whether or not my efforts would be better placed in some other field. Um, usually, when people go to justify these questions, they, they say things like, well, there are material benefits. With the medical sciences, the material benefits are obvious. We don't die as much anymore as we used to because of medical science. Um, but with astronomy, it's kind of difficult to say that there are any material benefits. You can make the argument that uh, researching fundamental questions uh, give, gives rise to practical benefits in unexpected ways. You know, for example, the, the founders of electricity, they weren't thinking, oh, this would be a great way to power a modern society. They were just thinking, oh, this phenomenon is kind of cool. I'm going to study it. So maybe there might be some tenuous uh, connection to material benefits there. But as somebody who studies astronomy, I don't really see it. It's, it's maybe in some distant future when humanity leaves the planet Earth, it might be good to have a catalog of all of the things that are out there. But we're hardly going to be getting off Earth to go to Mars in the next century, let alone leave the solar system. So it seems that our knowledge of astronomy is, is far beyond uh, what any practical benefits might come from it. Um, so yeah, it's hard to imagine a future where any of our knowledge of the cosmos on the larger scales will have any material significance. But in any case, that's not why astronomers do astronomy. Um, you know, nobody, nobody goes into astronomy astronomy thinking that they're going to cure cancer, because if they did, I would suggest they find you know, something else to do with their time. Um, and it's not why people come to astronomy talks. If people here will probably know this. You didn't come here thinking that I was going to reveal some grand invention that was going to revolutionize your life. Um, you know, people come to astronomy talks because they just are interested in space. Uh, I guess if I, you were one of the people that I forced to come because you're my friend, you may not be interested in space, you're just more interested in me. But in any case, <laughs> There are people aren't interested in the practical benefits of astronomy and neither the public nor astronomers themselves. So then the question that we kind of have to, to ask is why are people interested in astronomy? Why is there this disproportionate interest that doesn't seem to be fully justified? Um, well, one of the sort of naive answers that you can give that's sort of a first pass to how you might answer this question is that the night sky belongs to everyone. Um, you know, as long as you have a working pair of eyes, you can just stay up a little bit past your bedtime and walk out into a field and look up. And there you go, you have the night sky, which is the object of study for astronomers. Um, this isn't really the case with most other sciences. For example, particle physics. Uh, you know, I can't see subatomic particles. And 
even though I can maybe understand it abstractly, I need to have quite a strong foundation in the mathematics behind all these things to even really get a, a feel for what particle physicists are even talking about. And in the case of chemistry, well, you know, there's only so many baking soda and vinegar volcanoes you can make in your lifetime before you get bored of it. Uh, the, the experience uh, of, of working in a lab is just not accessible to a lot of people. So in, in a way, astronomy is the most accessible science in that everyone, regardless of where you are, can have access to the thing that astronomers study. So maybe that's why people are interested in astronomy and are not so interested in other, in other subjects because you know space is just a thing that we all have access to. People are naturally interested about science and space is just one of those things that we can all uh, see. But I don't think that this is the full explanation. I could end my talk here and then say that's done, we're done. Um, but I don't think that that is the full picture. And the reason for that is if you look at history, astronomy has been, uh, has been an integral part of the cultures of basically all peoples for uh, spanning the, uh, from now until the beginning of history, basically. Uh, no matter where you go, you will see that astronomy has, been, has played a, a role of important cultural significance to basically all cultures. Um, just to give a snapshot of how different cultures have, have used astronomy, uh, the Babylonians, or the Sumerian, ancient Sumerians um, were, were mapping the stars as early as, uh, I forget the date, like 1500 BCE or something like that. Um, uh, and they, they were able to map the, the movement of the stars and actually understand that the planets moved in distinct ways from the stars and they associated gods with those planets. And we see those planetary gods show up in the astrology of later Mesopotamian civilizations like the Babylonians. And the Babylonians took that modeling of the sky to even further levels by applying precise mathematics to it so that they could precisely predict the dates when things like eclipses were going to occur. And then they could use this to build calendars, for example. Um, the Lapita civilization, which were bas basically the cultural antecedents to the Polynesians, they used astronomy as a navigation tool to basically spread to the remotest parts of the Pacific. Um, and then of course, most people educated in, in the Western world will be familiar with the relative importance of astronomy in Greek uh, history. Uh, the Greeks furthered this Babylonian tradition of precisely modeling the heavens with mathematics, but also uh, natural philosophers like Plato and Aristotle began to think not just how, not they didn't just want to understand how the, the, uh, the stars moved across the sky. They wanted to understand why they did so. So they started proposing physical explanations for why that happened, uh, which is sort of a precursor to modern science. Um, and of course, we can talk about all sorts of examples of astronomy in history, various civilizations, all, I mean, all civilizations all around the world have had astronomy play a central role in their culture in many ways. Um, and I don't want to go through that here because it would be a very long talk indeed. Um, and there is actually another talk in the series that, that was done previously about archaeoastronomy, which is basically this, looking at how uh, astronomy has played a role in different cultures across different times. So before I move on with what I'm with a point I'm trying to make, I just want to make one distinction clear, which I think is pretty important. So when I say astronomy, I mean I mean a lot of different things. I'm grouping a bunch of different things together. So part of that, of course, is the modern scientific discipline of astronomy, which is what me and my colleagues do. Um, but I'm also uh, referring to ancient astronomy which, you know, as we discussed, is what the Greeks would have done, is what the Babylonians or the Lapita would have done. Um, and this can encompass a lot of different things that aren't included in modern scientific astronomy. So yes, it can include mapping out the stars. It can include coming up with explanation for the stars, but it also includes aspects of uh, astrology and religion. So using uh, um, astrology, of course, is using the stars to divine the future. And this is distinct from what I'm calling traditional astronomy. So traditional astronomy, I would say, is uh, cultural groups today using astronomy in their traditional ways. For example, many indigenous uh, peoples around the world uh, still use and still pass down their astronomical knowledge in the way that they understand it and the way that they have used it in their cultures. And so the reason that I wanna make this sort of distinction clear is because when I say astronomy, I mean all of these things. Um, and 
these distinctions have been either blurred or made too harsh uh, for different political purposes. For example, the distinction between modern scientific astronomy and traditional astronomy has in the past been blurred, for example, to justify the use of indigenous lands to build telescopes because people will say, oh, it's all astronomy. So the, these, uh, these, uh, these indigenous groups must be okay with us using their land to do astronomy. Um, so those distinctions have been blurred for those purposes, but also distinctions have been made between modern scientific astronomy and ancient astronomy to exclude certain contributions from different groups because people will say, oh, well, that's not real astronomy, that's all just astrology, but things are not usually so simple. Um, and so I just want to make the language clear. Uh, it won't really come up very much, but when I say astronomy, I mean a bunch of different things, and I will try to be clear when I mean modern scientific astronomy, I will try to say that specifically. And of course, I'm excluding certain modern phenomena like pseudoscience, for example, flat earth. I think most people can get behind that exclusion. Um, so moving on. Uh, so the point that I've been trying to make with these examples is that uh, astronomy has played a central role in many different societies, cultures throughout time. And if you look at these, the roles that astronomy has played, you will often see a connection to the divine. You know, the Greeks, for example, uh, thought the heavens were was a realm of perfection. Uh, the the celestial bodies were divine in nature. And of course, as I you know, many many uh, civilizations have used astrology to divine the future. Um, and just as a specific textual example of this phenomenon. I will draw your attention to a passage from the Bible. Um, this is from a Psalm. You have set your glory in the heavens through, through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? So I admit, I understand the, uh, Maybe it's a little bit odd to see a Bible passage being quoted in an astronomy talk. But the point I'm trying to make here is that throughout different religions, and especially the Bible, you will see passages like this that are directly comparing the majesty of the heavens to the majesty of God, or whatever God you believe in. Um, so uh, in particular, I mean, this is just obvious to English speakers because the word heavens I mean, literally, it just refers to the sky, but there's a lot of religious connotations there. Um, but we don't have to look to religious sources to see this connection to the divinity. There's, there are secular ways that this is done too. Um, and this is an excerpt from a poem by Ada Limon called Dead Stars. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash, the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. And it's true, we keep forgetting about Antlia, Centaurus, Draco, Lucerta, Hydra, Lyra, and Lynx. But mostly we're forgetting we're dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust and I wish to reclaim the rising, to lean in the spotlight of streetlight with you toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. So if you don't really know what this is referencing, this is referencing something that Carl Sagan kind of made popular this idea that we are made of stardust or star stuff. Um, and the idea is, well, the elements that make up the earth that make up my body and your body were forged in the core of stars. Uh, well, most of the elements, some of the heavier elements, I guess most of the elements were made in a, a supernovae, but the lighter elements that are most common were forged in the core of stars. And then heavier elements were formed when those stars exploded. And then those stars scattered their dust all over the place uh, in these nebulae. And then um, that dust would coalesce gravitationally to form planets and potentially those planets could host life. So in a very literal sense, uh, human beings are made of star stuff. Um, and we can see by highlighting this point, we're doing a similar thing that religious uh, texts do in drawing a connection between astronomy and our place of origin. Uh, this is sort of a secular version of divinity because we're not saying that, oh, the stars are gods, but we're saying, that they are the source of our life. They give us life, they are our progenitors uh, in a very literal sense. So this is kind of a secular version of this idea of divinity. So 
So we see that astronomy isn't just something of maybe casual curiosity for most people. It actually holds a deep cultural significance for many people. And then the question we can start to ask is why is astronomy so readily associated with the divine in this way? What about it? Because I could, why don't I associate, you know, just leaves with gods? Why, why are there no leaf gods? Maybe there are, there are probably leaf gods, you know, there's all sorts of gods. But astronomy is something that is sort of a constant across civilizations. Um, and to see the answer to this, I think most people kind of have a sense intuitively why. And you can get that sense uh, just by going outside and looking at the sky. Uh, and if you do so, you will see that, you know, on a very dark night, the sky is very pretty. Um, it's kind of a cliche to say, but it really does look like a sea of diamonds stretching out into infinity, all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, uh, contrary to popular opinions, things like, uh, things like shooting stars aren't that rare. If you go out on any, on any given night, you're bound to see a couple. And in the atmosphere, stars twinkle. So it's not just a, a pretty static scene. It's a very vibrant living scene. Um, so, you know, you go out and you'll see that it's pretty, but if you look at it for long enough, you'll start to feel something else. It's not merely a benign, nice thing to look at. Um, you'll start to sort of naturally think about how distant all of these things are. Uh, for some of the stars, the light has been traveling for hundreds of thousands of years. So that means not only are you looking at something that's super far away, because light has a finite speed, it means you're looking back in time because it takes time for that light to reach our eyes. Um, so the stars you're seeing are many hundreds of thousands of years old in some cases. Um, but also these, they may look like pinpoints on the sky, but we know that they're massive. You know, a star can be many times the size of the sun, which already is, is many, many times the size of the earth. So, you know, when you look out, you're really looking out into a sea of infinity and you start to feel something that isn't just, oh, this is what a lovely view. Um, and what that feeling is, it has a word in English and that word is awe. Um, and fortunately for us, many philosophers and aestheticians in Western society have spent a lot of time thinking about this feeling. Uh, it has been alternatively called the feeling of the sublime, if you want to go the pretentious route. Um, so Edmund Burke, said of awe that it's the strongest emotion the mind is capable of feeling. So it's, it's something, it's, it's there, but what, what is it? Um, so we can look to Schopenhauer maybe for an answer. And what he said, this is his description of what happens when we, when we experience awe. Uh, Schopenhauer says, when we lose ourselves in the contemplation of the extent of the world in space and time, then we feel ourselves reduced to nothing, feel ourselves as individuals, as living bodies, a transient appearances of the will, like drops in the ocean fading away into nothing. But at the same time, our immediate consciousness is that all these worlds really exist only in our representation. The magnitude of the world, which we used to find unsettling, is now settled securely within ourselves. It appears only as the felt consciousness that we are one with the world and thus not brought down but rather elevated by its immensity. So what does that mean? That's just fancy um, dead white person uh, speak for, for something that's kind of simple. Basically awe has two parts to it. Um, first of all, the objects of awe are scary. They make us feel our own insignificance. When we look at something that is awe inspiring, we feel powerless and unimportant. But that's not the only part to it because I think most people would agree who have, the people who have experienced awe, they would agree that it's not an unpleasant experience. Maybe there is some aspect of existential terror thrown in there, but in general, it's kind of a pleasurable experience. People like to look at the sky. Um, and that's because there's a second part to the feeling of awe. And that's what I'm going to call reconciliation. Um, and, and what I mean by that is objects of awe don't just make us feel small. They make us feel like we're part of something bigger as well. You know, when I look at the sky, I don't just feel like I'm a tiny little insignificant human. I feel part of the universe that I'm looking at. Uh, oh, and I should say that I'm, so I'm calling, I'm using the terminology decentralization and reconciliation. So awe is made of two parts, this idea of decentralization. And what I mean by that is uh, human, humans kind of have a, a ten, natural tendency to make ourselves the center of our own stories, either as individuals or as a species. 
So, you know, we have this natural tendency to put ourselves at the center of the universe, sometimes literally. Um, and so things of things that inspire awe, they, they at least momentarily force us to question that assumption. They force us to decentralize ourselves from the story of creation. Um, so there are two parts of awe, it's decentralization and reconciliation. Um, in other words, awe is something like participatory terror. It's you're afraid, but you're also participating somehow in the thing that's making you afraid. Um, and that kind of makes you feel bigger than maybe you actually are. So what are some things, other things that in astronomy that make us feel awe just as examples? Well, usually things in nature uh, do the trick. Big things in nature usually do the trick. For example, just a mountain range. Um, so if you have ever stared at a very large mountain range in the distance, you might be familiar with this feeling. Uh, you look at a mountain and you realize, well, I'm extremely insignificant compared to this giant thing. Because I could take, I could get all of my friends with all of the best technology and our, and our shovels and whatever, and you can go digging and you're not gonna make a dent in that, that uh, mountain, even, in, even if you dug for your entire lifetime. Um, and this mountain has been here longer than, than you have, much longer, um, and it will continue to be here for long after you are dead. Um, and it's also, it's not just a static thing that's been here for a long time that you can't touch. It's also a dangerous thing. A lot of people die all the time going uh, hiking in mountains when they're unprepared. You know, think of all of the people that have died trying to reach the top of Mount Everest. So when you really stop to think about mountains, they're kind of scary things. They're things that could kill you. And they are things that you can do nothing uh, about. You can't, you can't stop a mountain from doing what it wants. Um, not that mountains really want anything, but uh, the idea is that when you think about mountains, you are forced to confront your own relative insignificance. But at the same time, when you look upon a mountain range, uh, you're looking upon uh, nature that's part of earth. Uh, the soil that makes up the mountain is the very soil that you are from. Um, so while you are indeed insignificant compared to the mountain, you are a part of, of, of what makes earth so beautiful. Um, you are in, in many ways, this is the, the mountain is your home. It's not just this thing that is there. It's part of what, what makes up your home. Uh, another example of awe-inspiring things, uh, you know, cathedrals, the great cathedrals of Europe, the architects, they very well understood this dual nature to the experience of awe. Um, so the very concept of a church is one where the fact that you can enter into God's house means that you can share in God's glory. But at the same time, the architects knew that if they built these large vaulting ceilings with these, uh, with these ornate stained glass windows and sculptures all over the place, that the moment you walk into a cathedral and you're forced to look up, uh, you are left with no illusion of your own importance relative to God. So yes, it is a place that you can enter and share in a religious experience with God, but you, know, you can't forget because of how it's designed, you're not allowed to forget how unimportant you are. So this is uh, just another example of people intentionally designing buildings to evoke this, this experience of awe. So how does astronomy do the same thing? Um, well, let's focus on the first aspect of awe, which is decentralization. Um, and it does it in a couple of ways. The first way is in space. So if we think about the distance to the sun, that's about eight light minutes away. So that means that light takes eight minutes to travel from the sun to earth. And in terms of kilometers, kilometers, it's about 1.5 by 10 to the eight kilometers or um, uh, 100 million kilometers. Um, so the sun is very far away from us. And this is a fact that has been known uh, for many millennia. The ancient Greeks, for example, knew the distance to the sun approximately. They used some rudimentary parallax calculations to uh, measure the distance to the sun from earth. Um, so the fact that space is very large has been known to us for a long time. And of course, uh, if you know the distance to the sun and you know how to measure the distance to the sun, it's very easy to infer that the distance to stars, other stars, are much, much further away. Um, so for, for, for millennia, humanity has known that space is vast, much vaster than, than anything we could measure on Earth. Um, and with modern astronomy, that the vastness of space has just been getting even bigger. 
uh, the distance to Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star, is four light years. So again, that means that it takes light four years to travel from Proxima Centauri to us. Uh, the distance to the galactic center is 26,000 light years. Um, the distance to Andromeda, the closest galaxy, is 2.5 million light years. And then the distance to uh, the, the farthest galaxy is 32 billion light years, uh, which so as we as we go uh, up this rung, we get to orders of magnitude more distant objects. And then the radius of the observable universe is 46 billion light years. And that's everything we can see. Uh, as far as we know, the space uh, that the space that we can't see uh, extends indefinitely. So, you know, the, in terms of physical size, humanity occupies a very, 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 very insignificant portion of the universe. And it's not just space, it's also time. Being generous, we can say that a human lifetime is about 100 years, um, which is quite short, even in comparison to the length of time that human beings have been around, uh, that Homo sapiens have been around, which is about 200,000 years. If we compare that to the age of the sun, you know, that's not even a fraction of it. The sun has been around for 4.6 billion years and the universe a couple of times that 13.8 billion years. So in, in terms of a percentage, the human life is 0.000001% of the age of the universe. Um, as a fraction of the year, if, if the universe um, had been around for a year, then that would mean that a human life would, have, would be uh, approximately 0.1 seconds. So barely noticeable in terms of reaction time. Um, but then that's just the past. Let's look into the future. The time until the degenerate era, which is the era in which stars start to turn off um, and become other things like white dwarfs. Um, uh, the, then the, the time until that is one quadrillion years. And then the time until the heat death of the universe, which is basically when all activity stops in the universe, that's 10 to the 90 billion years. So one followed by 90 zero billion years in the future. So as a fraction of that, a human life, even the age of, of um, the human species, it's not even a drop in the ocean. It's not even uh, an atom in a drop of an ocean. It's, it's just completely transient. Like you might as well not even care that humans existed. Like what, 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 you, what even is the point uh, in comparison to the age of the universe? So in space and time, we, we sort of immediately see humanity's insignificance in, uh, in relation to the universe as a whole, uh, but also in terms of power. The most powerful object that humans have created uh, was the Sar Bomba weapon, a nuclear weapon, which when it was detonated, whoops, uh, which when it was detonated, released 10 to the 17 joules of energy. Uh, in comparison to the sun, um, the sun releases 10 to the 26 watts of energy. So that's 10 to the 26 joules per second. Or in terms of this bomb, that's 1 billion SAR bombas per second. Uh, and that's just the sun. The sun is compared to many other cataclysmic events in astronomy, a relatively weak thing. Uh, for example, supernovae, which are uh, exploding stars, release uh, up to about 10 to the 27 of these SAR bomba objects. And then we can look at quasars, which are um, caused by um, supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, just basically eating a bunch of material in the surrounding galaxy that gets heated up as it spirals into the black hole, and then that releases a jet of energy. Uh, that one of those jets, which is shown in this little picture here, that jet, that little jet on the sky contains about a trillion suns. That's how much uh, energy output is coming from that jet. So even if um, humanity all decided to build a super weapon, um, which we probably wouldn't do because we usually want to build super weapons to kill each other, not as a, some grand collective project. But if we all put all of our resources to, to building one giant super weapon, we couldn't come close to even the weakest uh, astronomical events. So, and these astronomical events could wipe us out in a second. Um, and so, you know, compared to the power of astronomy, we, we just, we have none basically. Um, and this has sort of been the history of astronomy. Uh, as we learn more about astronomy, we, we reveal our own uh, insignificance. And this happens over and over again in the history of astronomy. Um, there, of course, 
a case of literal decentralization that most people are familiar with. Uh, prior to a few centuries ago in Europe, the accepted model of the solar system was that the earth was in the center. This is the geocentric model. Um, and then everything orbited in circles around the earth, basically. But, uh, you know, towards the, the enlightenment, people started to realize, well, that doesn't really fit the data. Uh, maybe a better model would be the sun is at the center of, of the solar system and the earth is orbiting around the sun. Um, and of course there was fierce debate and people usually know the story, the main uh, players of the story being the Pope and Galileo. And they were kind of at cross purposes, the Pope arguing for a geocentric model and Galileo arguing for the heliocentric model. Um, I think most historians nowadays agree that the narrative of, of the Pope versus Galileo has, has been sort of overplayed in a way that has, that has sort of been used to push a narrative of enlightenment rationality versus religious dogmatism that isn't exactly historically faithful, um, but I'm not an expert in that, so I can't really debunk those kinds of theories. But the point is, what I can say is that there was debate, there was fierce debate about whether or not we should accept a heliocentric model, one in which humanity was literally decentralized from, uh, from the universe. Um, and the, the reasons that people sort of resisted weren't all completely scientific. There, there were reasons uh, people had saying that, well, it's just, it makes sense that humans are at the center of the universe because humanity is special. Um, for a variety of reasons. So of course we're at the center. Uh, what are you saying? Don't be stupid. That Those kinds of arguments. But of course, in the end, um, the heliocentric model won out because the evidence was just, it was just in favor of that model. Um, and it was hard to get around that. Um, so this leads to a rather important point. So as we, as I, I've been arguing, the uh, decentralization has been a thing that has happened over and over again in the history of astronomy, uh, so much so that, has that it has become a guiding principle of astronomy. Um, and I say this specifically with regards to the study of cosmology, which is the study of the universe on the largest scales. Um, so cosmology rests upon what is called the Copernican principle. And the Copernican principle is named after Copernicus who came up with this heliocentric model of the solar system. Um, and basically it states that human beings do not occupy a special place or time in the universe. So why do we have to assume that this is true? So because we live on, on such small scales and in such a localized part of the universe in terms of time, um, if I wanna go study the universe and I wanna go make claims about how the universe looks like, then I have to assume that I'm not in some special place because most of the universe I simply do not have access to. I, I can't go and see what the universe is like over there. So I have to assume that the, what the universe is like over here is roughly the same as, as it is everywhere, basically. So uh, that idea of the Copernican principle is hard baked into how we do cosmology. And this is something I don't think we, we should take for granted. Uh, because if you are, um, if you were educated, at least in Canada, where I, I know this is the case, and I'm sure it's probably the case in most places in the world, if you go to any uh, elementary school, you're, you're bound to see um, posters like these ones. This one is of the solar system showing a heliocentric model, and this one is showing the Big Bang, uh, uh, the, the evolution of the universe following the Big Bang. Um, and so from the earliest ages, we are taught the basic facts of astronomy. And we are taught, even though it's not usually specifically framed in this way, we are taught that hum humans are decentralized uh, from the universe uh, in, a, in a physical way. Um, you know, we aren't at the center of the universe in any sense, uh, either in space or time or in any way. Um, so this is something I don't think we should take for granted because what this means, it has very important uh, impact on the kinds of stories we can tell about humanity's importance. Prior to a few centuries ago, uh, you know, if you had some grand vision of, or a, a grand theological vision of humans being uh, occupying some central importance in the, your, the sort of hierarchy of your universe, then you could easily just claim that, oh, uh, it also manifests in a physical way. Humans are at the center of, of the solar system 
uh, you know, just look, that, that kind of thing. But what modern scientific astronomy has done is it has pushed these kinds of stories to a non-literal realm. You can no longer claim uh, physical, uh, a physical manifestation of this principle that humans are central to the universe's importance. Um, so I think that is something that we, we shouldn't exactly take for granted. It is something that has had uh, an enormous impact on the kinds of stories we tell ourselves as a society. Um, okay, so that's decentralization. Astronomy in a variety of ways reminds us that we are powerless, that we are insignificant, that the universe doesn't care about us. It's kind of a dire picture. Um, and I don't think uh, that most people would be interested in astronomy if all it had to offer us was a reminder of how much or how little we are. And of course, as I said, uh, with awe, that's not the only thing. There are two parts to it. There's also reconciliation. Um, we have to, it, it reminds us of our insignificance, but it also provides a path for us to uh, come to peace with this, uh, be at peace with this insignificance. Um, so how does it do this? Uh, the first way is sort of an obvious way. It does it because astronomy tells us the story of creation. Um, the, the very study of astronomy, uh, it basically gives us a history uh, from the beginning of the universe to now of how, the, how nature has evolved to create us, which is a very personal story. Um, and it reminds us that we're not just looking at random objects far away from us. These things have a, have a very deep personal significance to us because we come from this universe. Uh, through the ast astronomical processes that we study, we learn about how we came to be as a species, uh, which is a very personal story and is the is a main reason why astronomy can also provide this idea of reconciliation. Uh, again, this harkens back to what Carl Sagan said, that we are made of star stuff, um, that, that the, the objects we study are the things that create the material uh, for our being. And then there's another way that astronomy uh, allows us to reconcile with this sort of idea of insignificance, and that's through understanding. Um, so that has two parts to it. The first is that uh, the history of astronomy is a story of immense human achievement. You know, if I were to tell you that some half-formed ape could understand anything about the Big Bang or a few seconds after the Big Bang, then you wouldn't believe me. That just wouldn't make any sense. Like how can uh, a, a species of, of, of apes on a rock hurtling through space just by looking at the stars figure out um, how to figure out anything about the very beginning of the universe? Like it, it seems unlikely and yet it's the truth. You know, modern cosmologists have a very detailed account of the universe as far back as uh, you know, fractions of a second after the Big Bang. So this story is one of immense human achievement, both intellectual and uh, technological, because a lot of te technology has gone into advancing the study of astronomy. But there's a more abstract way in which astronomy um, eases our fear in the face of powerlessness. And it does that through just the very idea that if you understand something, it's harder to be afraid of it. Um, by understanding the natural world, we can, we can uh, reconcile ourselves by understanding our own place in the natural world. Um, and this idea isn't novel or anything. Lots of people have, have talked about how uh, natural wisdom leads to a sort of a reconciliation with, with the often terrifying power of the natural world. Um, Tom McLeish, uh, is a scientist and he wrote a book basically on this subject, Faith and Wisdom in Science. Um, and he says that the drive to understand natural phenomena as a way to reconcile ourselves with the chaotic natural world is an ancient tradition. Um, and he specifically focuses on the book of Job uh, in, in his book uh, as textual evidence for this. And if you aren't familiar with the book of Job, basically it's one of the foundational texts of Judeo-Christian religions. Um, and basically Job is just this upstanding righteous guy. He, he doesn't believe he has any sin and by all accounts, he, he doesn't have any sin. Um, and yet bad things happen to him. He, 
his children die, uh, his crops fail, uh, he's visited by many plagues, and he just has a really bad time of it, basically. And so he goes around asking his friends, um, why would God do this to me? Why would somebody so morally upstanding as myself be visited with all of these punishments? And his friends are completely useless and they, they can offer no explanation. Um, but at the end, God comes down and he gives uh, Job an answer. Uh, and his answer is, this is an excerpt of his answer. It's a very long answer, but it's basically all the same. He just says basically all of the same things. And so this is just an excerpt of that. Uh, can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? And the Pleiades is a constellation or it's a star cluster in the sky um, or loose Orion's belt. Can you bring out Maseroth in its season or guide Eldabaran with its train? Do you determine the laws of heavens and can you establish its rule upon earth? So this answer is kind of peculiar and it has perplexed uh, theologians and literary scholars a lot because it kind of seems like it's not an answer at all. It sort of sounds like God is just flexing on Job and saying, look, look at all of the things that I can do and you can't do any of these things. So shut up and, and go, go die of the pops or something like that. Um, which on a, on a first reading is basically how it reads. Uh, but if you look at it deeper, uh, a few themes start to, to come out of it. Um, and basically God's answer to Job isn't as dismissive as it initially seems. It's doing two things. Uh, first, it's decentralizing Job from creation. Uh, you know, he's asking all of these questions of Job. Can you do this? Uh, have, have you counted the stars? Have you done all of these things? Um, well, no, Job hasn't, he's just a human. And the idea is, is that God is rejecting the premise of Job's question. Basically, he's saying, well, um, the, the idea is that, uh, um, so, so the idea is that he's rejecting the premise of Job's question because Job is trying to uh, impose a human value system on nature. He's asking why are things happening to me because I'm so good, that doesn't make any sense. So what he's doing is he's looking at natural phenomenon and he's trying to impose his own human centric value system and trying to ask questions of nature uh, from that uh, framework. And uh, God is saying, well, that's not how nature works. God doesn't, uh, nature doesn't work according to a human value system. So your, your question doesn't make sense to begin with. Find another question. Um, but again, it's not completely dismissive because these questions that he's asking aren't rhetorical. Uh, he's not just saying, can you, uh, can you determine the laws of the heavens um, as a way to mock Job? These are earnest questions. He's saying, can you determine the laws of heavens? Uh, if not, then you should go do that because that is how you, rather than trying to impose your own values on nature, by understanding nature, you can come into some form of reconciliation with how nature operates. You can situate yourself in nature and understand your place in it. Um, and so this, so God's answer is offering a path to reconciliation with the natural world through natural wisdom. And this natural wisdom is what we would call science today. So Tom McLeish writes specifically, science is the name we now give to the deeply human task of participating in the mending of our relationship with nature. Um, so if you are listening to this and you're thinking, what on earth is this person talking about? This isn't how I learned science. When I was in high school, nobody was talking about the book book of Job, they, they just taught, taught us the scientific method. They weren't saying that, oh, you know, science is some grand uh, human uh, innate desire to understand nature or anything like this. It's just science is science. So what on earth are you talking about? Um, I would completely forgive you for this impression because this isn't how science is portrayed in the media. If you look at uh, just popular news articles about science or technology, you will see a, a lot of different things. Um, and they frame science not in, a, in this way that I'm saying as a humble uh, approach to understanding nature. They frame it rather as a way to dominate nature, science as a tool to, uh, to control our surroundings um, and, to, um, and to impose our will upon it. And so you can see this in a lot of different uh, popular science things. Uh, you know, there are biohackers 
who think that they can, rather than using medicine to adapt to what nature throws at us, they, their goal is to uh, preemptively make the human bodies, the human body better uh, and to basically make it, basically to redesign it to our own ideals. And then there are, there are cults of immortality on the internet where their stated goal is basically to ensure that humans live forever by decoupling us from nature with various technological means. Um, and then you have people like Elon Musk saying stupid things all the time. Here he's saying that some new technology he has could make language obsolete as if that were a thing. But even in rather innocuous ways, the language around science can um, uh, is often the language of dominance uh, when you when people talk about quantum supremacy, um, and then there are you know other people who think that uh, that science is the be all and end all that can determine even moral questions of what we should do with our lives. So the dialogue around science in the popular media is very far from the kinds of things that I'm talking about. It's really a, a dialogue of using science as a tool to dominate our surroundings. Um, and I'm not saying that this is always a bad thing. Like I'm not saying, oh, you know, we, I, I hearken back to the days when, when we were hunter gatherers and we all died at the age of 30. I, I'm not saying that that's a good thing, um, but I do think that we have lost this, this thread and this ancient tradition of using science, not just as a tool, but as a way of understanding our own relationship with nature. Uh, and I, I think this is an unfortunate, un, an unfortunate loss, because if we look at, you know, what is happening now with the, with the current plague we are all living through, um, it reminds us that, you know, no matter what kind of amazing technology we have, uh, we will never outrun nature. Nature will always be more powerful, smarter than us. Um, and it can find a million different ways to kill us and to make our lives miserable. Um, and so, you know, if our only focus is on using science as a tool to combat nature, we are doomed to fail. Uh, we also should be focusing on using science as a way to reconcile ourselves, our rather tenuous position in nature. Um, so Martin Rees, the astronomer Royal, writes about the situation of how science is perceived in popular media uh, in this way. He, he says, science pervade, pervades our lives more than ever, but the glad optimism about science has faded. In many quarters, observers view the impact of new breakthroughs with more ambivalence than excitement. Our marvelous new technologies have created fresh hazards and raised new ethical quandaries. Many commentators are anxious that science is getting out of hand, such that neither politicians nor the public can assimilate or cope with it. Uh, and basically what he's referring to here is kind of something that has happened over the course of the 20th century, which I, of course, was not around for most of, um, but one reads, so one has some idea. Um, basically, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of optimism about all of these new technologies that were coming out of science that were going to revolutionize, revolutionize our lives and make them so much better. Um, and the legacy of that optimism is basically that the conversations around science shifted from, from uh, uh, a very humane uh, approach to understanding our way, our, our, our existence to, you know, this amazing tool that we can use to uh, bring about some grand vision of how reality should be. Um, but then of course, other events in the 20th century kind of shattered that, that image. Um, you know, the usage of the atomic bombs the explosion of, uh, of nuclear reactors like Chernobyl, or the realization that climate change, uh, man-made climate change, uh, poses an existential threat to our existence. Um, so the, the optimism uh, about science following these events sort of fizzled out. And now we're left in this weird position where the dialogue about science uh, in popular culture still is centered around this optimistic, outlook that science can provide us all of these wonderful things and yet everybody knows that these claims are kind of su suspect um you know everybody has sort of a has even people who are very pro-science know know that science comes with hazards 
And it's not all just roses and uh, the, uh, an amazing tool for, for bringing about a utopia. There are dangers. Um, and I think that uh, this is because the, the sort of tension between in how science is talked about in public media and how people receive science is in part due because we've lost this idea of science being a way to understand um, and not just to dominate. Uh, and now you're probably definitely thinking that, that this person has really gone off the deep end. What does this have to do with astronomy? Now they're just talking about uh, science uh, in general. And to bring it back to astronomy, yes, I am talking about science in general, uh, I think that most sciences have have sort of lost this thread of an ancient tradition that I've been talking about, except for astronomy. Astronomy is the exception here because of what I've been saying um, throughout this talk, that the idea of decentralization is hard baked into how we do astronomy. It's hard baked into the facts of astronomy and also our approach to astronomical understanding. And also it's not just that, um, as I said before, it's hard to imagine any practical benefit um, that could come from studying astronomy. So by its very nature, astronomy sort of insists on reminding us that we are small and powerless and insignificant. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to control the universe on the largest scales. Like not even the most advanced civilization imaginable could ever uh, morph the universe to, to act in a way in accordance with its own values on the largest scales. It's just, that would be unbelievable. Um, so astronomy is, is sort of an exception to what I've been saying. It, uh, and that's part of why I think people are so interested in astronomy sort of naturally, because it is, it is a science that has relatively few pretensions. Um, it doesn't pretend that it's going to, to uh, solve all of our woes. It doesn't, in fact, you know, it, it reminds us of how insignificant we are. And I th think that it is in many ways the role of the astronomer to, to highlight this. Uh, and I think many astronomers do, even if they don't know that they're doing it in very uh, in explicit terms. I think that, you know, as astronomers, we have, uh, we are in a unique position to keep this ancient tradition of humility in the face of powerlessness and uh, humbly asking questions of the universe and studying it as a way to reconcile ourselves with it. Uh, it's, it, we have, we're in, we're in a unique position to keep this tradition alive. Um, so that's basically everything that I have to say. So just in summary, um, astronomy has enjoyed a great cultural significance across many times and cultures uh, with it often being associated with the divine. Um, I think I, I have tried to argue that at least partially the experience of awe explains this near universal significance. Um, and specifically, awe connects modern scientific wisdom to an ancient tradition of natural wisdom, a connection that for many other sciences has been kind of lost. Uh, so yeah, that's basically all I have to say for now. Hi, Dylan, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I was frantically typing in the chat. So I was a couple seconds behind coming back live. Um, yes, and the comments are going wild indeed. Um, so we have a couple of questions and I'm sure uh, some additional ones will roll in as we get the conversation going. I guess we'll, we'll hit you with an easy one first. Somebody is asking, what your kind of favorite topic overall in kind of astrophysics is. And maybe I, I suppose you could talk a little bit about what you kind of do in your studies. Um, yeah, what's your so, yeah, what's your favorite topic? <laughs> Let's yeah, go with so that. my favorite topic is the one that I study, which is cosmology. Um, and that's just studying the universe on the largest scale. So it's not thinking about planets or, or, um, or solar systems or even necessarily individual galaxies. It's thinking about how the universe evolves um, on the largest scales uh, since the time of the Big Bang. And sort of the reason that I, I really like cosmology is that I, I think it has a lot of, um, it's just sort of qualitatively different from most sciences. And it's because of what I was saying, um, this idea that it's based on the Copernican principle. 
uh, at its foundation, we have this, this assumption that we're in some non-special place and time. And I think this has some very interesting consequences for the way that cosmologists research uh, that they do it. Because it, we can't, we only have one universe. We can't build another universe and create an experiment and then study it like the way most people are taught the scientific method works. Um, so in that sense, it's very qualitatively different from the way we do other sciences. So that's sort of the, in brief, why, why it's my favorite. Amazing. And did you always know that that was your, that's oh. what you kind of wanted to, to study? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, I, yeah, I, yeah, I went through lo loads of periods of things to being my favorite. So hopefully this one sticks because it's the this one I'm actually doing my PhD in. <laughs> well, I mean, you're always allowed to change your mind, but I mean, you seem to be doing an excellent job of it. Um, we have a, another question from Ben, one of our regular viewers. Um, so he's asking, does the sort of ambivalence to new advances and discoveries, is that what, do you think that drives kind of a bit of a phobia to science? You know, you made reference to the hairdresser mm -hmm. joke saying, oh, I didn't like physics in high school. So I just, you know, kind of the washing hands of it. But do you think yeah. kind of that wonder and awe that scares people away somewhat? I think that that can be part of it. I think there is, in for many people, there's kind of a distaste they have for, for, for scientists because you have, I mean, most scientists aren't uh, out there saying, oh, I'm this, I'm a god among men. I can, I can do all of these amazing things with my science. Um, but you do have very prominent figures in the scientific community and in scientific communication who have a sort of arrogant attitude uh, with respect to what science can do and um, how, how it can revolutionize our lives. And I think that can be off-putting to a lot of people because for one thing, uh, in many ways, science is kind of a black box. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the scientific communication hasn't always been very effective. So for a lot of people, they just don't know what, uh, what science actually does. Um, and so if, you, if somebody comes up to you and says, in this black box, I have this magical uh, power that will transform the world, you're going to think they're a bit of a snake oil salesman. Um, so I think that it, it, is, um, uh, it is at least in part, the, the way that science is presented in the media um, by a lot of, uh, by, um, by many uh, prominent figures, um, I think that this, this does make, maybe put some people off uh, of science. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question completely, but- No, for sure. And, and Ben has since apologized in the chat. He said, sorry, this question is a bit of a minefield, <laughs> which I laughed about. But I mean, that's, you know, that's why we do events uh, yeah. such as this to kind of keep people uh, interested. Um, a lot of people loved your, your line flexing on, on Job. So <laughs> that's a good one. Keep, keep going with that. <laughs> um, so let's, just wait and see if we have um, any other questions. We'll give people just with the online delay a couple additional um, couple additional minutes. Um, oh, here we have a we have a good one from uh, another one of our regular amazing viewers, Isabella. She's asking, do you think that without the night sky or stars, um, humanity? maybe wouldn't be where we are today, you know, culturally, or I guess in a variety of ways. I mean, that is, is a very interesting question. And it is actually um, kind of a pressing question because uh, most people live nowadays in urban centers. And in urban centers, um, the sky, because of light pollution, uh, a lot of people don't have access to the, to the sky. You know, if you're in downtown Toronto, you look up and you can only see maybe the brightest of stars and, they're, they're, and the moon. So I think I don't have, don't really know the answer to this question because I'm not an anthropologist and it would be hard for me to answer the question. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it is important to think about because we are kind of losing access to the night sky. So it can be, it might be a concern that if, you know, uh, thinking about the night sky and dreaming about space drives a lot of our, a lot of our, um, uh, need for knowledge and technological advancement, then maybe the fact that we're losing it is problematic. Um, 
I would say though that I'm not super concerned because I think that this drive to understand is a very human need. Um, and the night sky is a very beautiful thing that does have a natural awe inspiring uh, aspect to it that I've been talking about. But I think sort of the need to understand the nature is so deeply ingrained in humans that even without the night sky, we'd, we'd find something to, to drive that focus. Cool, no, that is, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great answer. Um, is that, uh, let's look at some of these. Um, and, uh, oh, somebody's saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some Elon Musk comments. Oh, Isabella says, thank you for that. Um, and, uh, can I change? So somebody comments, um, it's maybe difficult. I am just a science guy in general. I get frustrated that on, uh, he says, I think he means climate change. I get frustrated that on climate change, for example, science as a fact isn't a given. Is that shared overall? What are your thoughts on that? I know you obviously you don't have a 100% answer, but what might your thoughts be on that? Yeah, well, I think that, so I also share the frustration that people, you know, don't accept the science behind uh, climate change because it is, basically irrefutable, um, you know, uh, but at the same time, I can, I can often understand why people have these ambivalent reactions to, to science. And I don't think, I think there's an instinct for people to say, oh, well, those people are just stupid and, un un and uneducated, so let's just ignore them. Yeah. Um, but I think that it is also a failure on the part of science communicators, um, because for some of the reasons that I've been saying, because uh, we don't always do a good job of explaining what's in the black box. Um, and so, you know, when, when you see this black box producing atomic bombs, um, producing, you know, uh, when you hear about fears that AI is going to take over the world, if you don't understand how that black box is, is working, maybe you think, um, well, you know, why is climate change? Why is that a thing that we can trust? If we can't trust all of these other things, why is this specific thing something we can trust? Um, and I don't have the solution to this problem. I can't. I don't know how to educate everybody in a way that is that is satisfying to everybody. But um, like I, I would be, it frustrates me. Yes, that that uh, people don't accept it. But I'm not going to be laying the blame on the people that don't accept it necessarily. Uh, I think that we do have to accept some responsibility as scientists for the state we're in. Mm -hmm. No, that's such a, yeah, that's such a great answer. Um, so we have another one here. And all of these are such big, such big questions. Um, I, mean, I think that should a be A lot of them do not, yeah, a lot of them do not have, you know, firm answers um, mm -hmm. for, but here's another one. Do you think by asserting that we are decentralized, um, as you mentioned, we risk overlooking some way in which we do happen to be in a special or privileged location of the universe uh, where we are? Um, so there are, I guess the answer to this is it's kind of complicated. I, I'm assuming that this, I'm going to answer this assuming that the question is a scientific one, like what do cosmologists do uh, when we have some sort of evidence that we are in fact in some special location? Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you do then? Um, and the answer to this is basically that, well, we've never really had to, had to face this, this possibility because our cosmological models do operate on this Copernican principle and they have been wild, wildly successful. Um, you might hear about things like the H not tension, which is a thing that often gets talked about in popular news. And indeed there are some, maybe some discrepancies in, in our models of the universe, but by and large, uh, we've just we just can fit the data to such uh, absurd precision um, and we can explain so many different phenomena with our cosmological models that rest upon this assumption that we're not in a special place or time um, and so you know maybe indeed that this may may not be the case and there are cosmologists who do think about uh, what would be the observable consequences if this weren't the case and can we test it um, but by and large 
our models are so successful that we haven't really had to question this assumption too much. Cool. No, th th these are all, um, yeah, great answers to like th these huge questions like that, you know, to tackle. Um, and then somebody is asking just a basic question. How long have you been involved in cosmology? Um, See, if I answer that, then I will be revealed as a fraud because I haven't, I, I come off like an expert, but I haven't been doing it for that long. Um, uh, so I guess, so I'm in my second year of my PhD, but I started doing undergraduate research in, a, in cosmology um, for about two years prior to the end of that. So that's like, that's four years, I guess. Amazing. That's, yeah, maybe that's three fabulous. and a half or something like that that's fabulous yeah you're i mean and you're so knowledgeable and and have, have given us an excellent presentation we've all um we've all learned a lot and and everybody is thanking you in the chat we'll give people a couple of more seconds um to see if there's any last uh minute things that they uh they'd like to ask uh, dylan this evening while we're waiting so there isn't an awkward silence um i'll let you know that um Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, I believe around 9 a.m., the next episode of A Picture in a Thousand Words will be released on this YouTube channel, on the Dunlap Institute channel. Um, and that's done by one of our, another one of our fabulous astronomers, uh, Dr. Mubdi Rahman. He'll take you through a picture and walk you through why it's important, its makeup, et cetera. Um, it took a couple of weeks off, but it is now back and better than ever. So please check that out tomorrow morning. Um, and um, just check the chat one more time. Um, just a lot of fabulous kudos and thanking you for uh, being here tonight. And I certainly enjoyed it. I was so excited for this talk. Um, so it looks like yeah, it looks like we have uh, no further questions this evening. So with that, um, we will uh, say goodnight. Thank you so much, Dylan. That was really great. And uh, we certainly- Thank you for moderating. <laughs> no worries. We certainly look forward to seeing, you know, more from you. And we'll have to definitely have you back at, at some point as we, as, as we consider, as we continue the series uh, in some way or another. Um, you know, just the, the conversation was, you know, a very different one tonight, but still extremely, extremely important. So I hope, uh, I hope people enjoyed it. So with that, um, I will, we will say good night and sign off and um, we hope good to night. see you soon. Good night. Bye. And